Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. It could have been perfect. Snowbound in a mountain lodge with a girl who was falling in love. But also present were a widow sick with rage, a bitter old woman, and a jealous man. All with reason to hate me more than anyone else in the world. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Grim Echo. Pretty thick. Yeah. yeah you, you're lucky you caught me, son. Yeah. It was just closing up. Yeah. Well, what do you have? Yeah, better fill it with a regular, huh? Okay. Does that mean that you're aiming to go on? That's right. Got to get back to L.A. I wouldn't advise it, son. Old Jacker and sure wouldn't. Liable to hit ten below, they say. Yeah. Where you been, skiing? Yeah, a week of it up at Angel's Roost. How's the road ahead? Well, you got 40 miles or nothing but mountains to the next town, you know. You're bound to get drifted over any time. Hey, why don't you blow that thing? Huh? Hey, what's the tariff? Oh, call it three bucks even. You know, I've been running this mobile gas station here for 20 years, and I know these storms are nasty. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'll be all right. Yeah, that's what you all say. Out on the road, you could freeze to death. Real easy. And this plaid shirt I'm wearing, you're ripping me, Pop. Uh, listen, that shirt won't even start to keep you warm on a deserted highway in this blizzard. Take it from old Jagger and son, I know. Yeah, well, thanks anyway. So long, old Jagger. a solid nerve-wracking hour to make 12 miles. And I began to realize just how right old Jack Ernst, the gas station boy, had been when the road ahead was lost completely in a constant racing blur of white. Transformed every rise into a treacherous barrier I had to batter my way through. With the chains on all four wheels chewing at the drifts, I managed to keep on the road somehow and plow out another five miles. And then... I caught a glimpse of the first lighted window I'd seen in all that distance just as I started down the backside of a short, steep hill. And then it happened. First, the helpless feeling of a skid. Before I could do anything about it, I was off the road in the ditch, nose first and hood deep, in a culvert drifted full of snow. I forced the door open and floundered back up to the road. I knew there was no chance of getting the car out without help and lots of it. And the ten below zero that the weather bureau had bragged about was setting in. I looked back through the slashing snow for the lighted window I'd spotted and saw a lantern swinging crazily in the hands of somebody coming toward me. A minute later, I could see it was a girl. Hello! Hello, are you hurt? No, I'm okay. Huh? My car's stuck. I skidded off the road. Yes, I know. I watched. Oh, my. No chance of getting it out of there tonight. Oh. That's bad. Maybe tomorrow, if the blizzard lets up, we can get you out. Meantime, you better come on up to the lodge, mister. Lodge? Uh-huh. You mean I slid off the road right in front of a tourist lodge? Uh, oh, boy, how can I be that lucky? Yeah, well, maybe it's fate. We're not open for business in the winter, but on a night like I this... I know what you mean, believe me. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Could get tough staying out here. Oh, by the way, my name's Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. I want to pay what? you for... Did you say Philip Marlowe? Yeah, is something wrong with What's that? your business, Mr. Marlowe? Oh, well, I'm a private detective from L.A. I've been skiing. Then it is you. I... I don't care where you've been or where you're going. You'll get no help from me, Mr. Philip Marlowe, you understand? I'd rather give shelter to a dirty dog. I hope you freeze, do you hear? I hope you freeze to death. 
She was a thin girl with black hollow eyes, full of hate for me. And she didn't stop or look back all the way to the door, just ran in and slammed it shut. I couldn't understand it. Even on my worst day, my reputation never was that bad. I didn't wait around to worry about it because I was cold. Besides, I wanted to know why the good name Philip Marlowe was such poison at a place I'd never heard of before. I waded up to the heavy, rustic door and looked in through a tiny window. All I could see was one corner of what had to be a big room. It was log, leather, and Navajo rugs, dominated by an enormous fireplace that filled every nook with a warm, dancing glow. <laughs> poison or no, I wanted in. Yeah, it sure did. Oh, well, uh, won't you come in? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm Donna. How are you? This is Echo Lodge. Uh, We're not open now, but, well, of course, you can't go on in the storm. No, I can't. Besides, my car's in the ditch. <laughs> well, uh, you'll be spending the night, then. I'd love to, but there seems to be two schools of thought on that subject. Well, what do you mean? Well, I don't know why, but, you know, I don't think I'm very welcome. Why do you say that? Well, I... Uh... I'll tell you why, Donna. Well, Helen, oh, dear, what's wrong? You've been crying. Do you know who he is? No, we haven't gotten around to the magic of my name yet, Helen, but maybe you'll be good Our enough to tell me. Our name is Baraki. Does that mean anything to you? Baraki? Oh, Helen, yes, what is it? Yes, Baraki. Virgil Baraki was my husband. Virgil Baraki was Donna's brother. And Virgil Baraki was the man that you shot down and killed. Do you remember? I remember it all right. Six months ago, a trail that led up a blind Los Angeles alley to a garage where stolen cars were switched. I remembered the pair of vicious blue eyes glaring at me over the sights of a blazing 45. I remembered shooting back fast. When it was over, I was alive and he was dying. And later, the coroner's jury decided I'd killed in self-defense. The savagery here in the eyes of the woman who'd been Virgil Barucki's wife said that that decision meant nothing. Yes, is this true? Are you the one who... Yeah, yeah, it's true. I shot a man named Virgil Barucki. I had to or be killed by him. There was no choice. You liar. You killed him in cold blood. Now, get out of here. You've done enough to us. Get out. Helen, stop it. Oh, Mama. Mama, Mama Barucki, listen, Mama. This is the man who killed Virgil. I know. I've been listening and I heard everything. Go find Ralph for me, Helen. Then you'd better go out to your workshop for a while. Did you hear me? I said this I is the man... I said who... go call Ralph now, at once. Tell him to open the cabin. Then go back to your carving. Can't turn a man out in this weather, not any man. You stay, Mr. Marlowe. Thank you, Mrs. Barucki. Donna, go get some hot food. All right, Mom. So, you're Philip Marlowe, the private detective. You don't look much like I'd imagined you. Do people ever? Perhaps not. Oh, um, would you mind fixing the fire? It needs another log. Oh, not at all. You, uh, were stopped by the storm, Mr. Marlowe? Yeah. <clears throat> My car skidded into the ditch about 50 yards down the road. I see. Almost at our doorstep, you might say. A rare coincidence, isn't it? Almost too rare, Mrs. Barucki. I, uh, I'm sorry the circumstances are painful for you. I've grown used to that kind of pain, having lost both a husband and a son. Fate up to now has never been very generous. Do you believe in fate, Mr. Marlowe? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, some things happen for which there's no explanation, no maybe, explanation? but... No explanation? Who knows? Perhaps everything happens according to a prearranged schedule. And for a purpose. Oh, come on. You don't really think I was deliberately shoved off the road at exactly this spot for a reason? Oh, well, you might admit it's strange, though, that there was a house nearby just when you needed one. And that it was our house. Oh, thank you, Donna. Oh, it's only soup, but it's hot and good, and there's fresh bread. The coffee will be ready in a few minutes. Go ahead, Mr. Marlowe. Sit down. It'll do you good. Thanks. It looks wonderful. In the meanwhile, I'll check up on Ralph. He should have the cabin ready by now. It's small, but you'll be comfortable. There's a fine big oil heater in it. I haven't worked one for years. You won't have any trouble. Tell me, uh, uh, who is this Ralph? Ralph Tolman, young fellow who lives near here. Uh, Ralph works for us in the summer. And looks after us in the winter. 
He's staying over tonight because of the storm. He was my son's best friend. Oh, uh, don't let the soup get cold, Mr. Marlowe. The soup was thick and delicious, and the coffee was rich, black, and steaming. Donna sat across the table and watched me eat. There was no hatred in her eyes. I looked for it closely. It wasn't even animosity. Only confusion, and for some reason, a shadow of fear. But as an hour slipped by and the conversation came easier, the shadow disappeared. Her eyes even began to smile a little. When I'd finished down to the third cup of coffee and started to help her clear the table, the cup slipped. They both grabbed for it, caught one slim inch from breaking, and wound up together on the floor. Our faces close. <laughs> Why, Phil, we did it. What a team. <laughs> table waiters are jugglers. Oh, we could double these <laughs> both and make a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ralph. Yeah, Ralph. What's going on? Uh, we have uh, almost dropped a cup. Uh-huh. And it sure would have been too bad, wouldn't it, Donna? You only got about 50 like that one. I, uh, I don't know why it's so important to you, but for what it's worth, I was the one who dropped it. It's not important to me. I guess other things aren't so important to Donna either. Think you can get it out to the kitchen now without any more help, Donna? Ralph, it's high time that you... Mrs. Barucki asked me to tell you the cabin's ready, Marlowe. Thanks. No thanks necessary, mister. It's just part of my job. Guess everybody's job has its lousy side, huh? Even a private detective. Some of them get trigger happy, I heard. I'll see you, Donna. You better get out there right away, Marlowe. Donna's got four whole dishes to carry out. And at the rate she's been going, she ought to get started or she'll never make it. Keep your fat trap shut, Buster. You're causing a draft. Tolman walked behind me as far as the door and pointed through the snow to a tiny square of light sitting apart from the rest of the buildings that made up Echo Lodge. As soon as I was outside, he slammed the door against my back and bolted it. I stood on the porch and thought about the setup for a minute while I lit a cigarette. And I stepped out into the snow and headed for the cabin. Halfway there, I could see it clearly. It looked snug and warm. And under the circumstances, I knew it was better for everybody that I was sleeping outside the main lodge. But then I saw a sudden flash and felt the impact before anything else. Right in front of me, the cabin lurched. One entire wall burst out and the roof collapsed. A second later, as I ran toward what was left of it, I could hear the others coming. Ralph, what was it? The cabin is blew up. Bill, 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 you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay, Donna. What happened, Marlowe? I don't know, Tolman. It must have been the heater, but I, I can't understand what happened, it. Ralph, I think the heater exploded. Yeah, yeah, Helen, that's the way it looks. But it was working okay when I left. I, I guess it's not going to burn, though. The snow put it all out. Oh, Bill, just another few seconds, and you'd have been in there. You'd have been killed. Yeah, maybe that was fate, too, huh? Maybe. Donna, get away from here. Oh, Helen. I wish you had been in there, Marlo. You deserve it. Hey. Stop it, Helen. He's got no business here. Stop it. Oh, let me alone. Good Lord, after what he's done to us, how can you bear even to look at it? Oh, Helen, come back here. Let her go. This was an accident, Donna. An accident, you hear? They happened. Don't say, Mr. Marlo. Oh, sure, sure. Everybody knows accidents will happen, Mrs. Barucki. Of course, but... Oh, then let's get back into the house before we freeze to death. You can have my room now. I'll sleep with Donna. Come along, all of you. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Groucho Marx, his famous ad-libs, and his teams of opposites will be back betting their lives on most of these same CBS stations tomorrow night. You've missed half your life if you haven't bet your life with Groucho Marx on Wednesday nights this season. Hear him on this top quiz show tomorrow night on CBS. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Grim Echo. It was a dreary little procession that trudged back toward the lodge again from the shuttered cabin. I said nothing and pushed hard against the storm as far as the front door. But when they were all inside, I ducked back into the biting blizzard and ran down to my car in the 38 I kept in the glove compartment there. I figured it would be a warning comfort through the long, cold night ahead. Until I saw that somebody else had figured the same way. 
The lock on the glove compartment had been sprung and the gun was gone. Now there was no doubt about the explosion. It had been no less accidental than Lucretia Borgia working over an after-dinner drink. As I hurried back to the lodge, I suddenly felt the kind of inside cold which you can't have a blame on the weather around you. But a moment later, that same cold began to thaw. Because huddled at the edge of the lodge steps ahead was Donna. Oh, where have you been? What have you been doing? Hey, everything's going to be all right. Oh, Bill, please. Oh, why did you go down to your car? Well, I'll tell you, but you're going to be sorry. Sorry? <laughs> but you got so upset over nothing. I wanted to get some cigarettes out of the glove compartment. I was fresh out. That, that was your only reason? Cigarettes? Sure, sure. Now, come on, huh? You got to worry. Let's do it where we can both be warm. <laughs> Come on over to the fire. I'm a city boy, you know. This cold isn't doing me any... Hey. Hey, Donna. Those tears in your eyes. There. They're from the wind. It, it always makes me cry. Yeah. Oh, Phil. Why do things have to be this way? An hour ago when you were eating, everything was so nice. So friendly. And then suddenly Ralph angry, the explosion, Helen screaming and clawing at your mama. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know what you mean. <laughs> But look, look, baby, listen to me hard, huh? Yes? You see, the things you just spoke of, Ralph, the explosion, Helen, all of it, all the trouble, it belongs to tonight, like the blizzard out there. Oh, it's raging now, sure, but tomorrow, or maybe a little after tomorrow, it'll stop. Everything will look bright and clean to you. Honest, honey, that's the way it'll be. All the way around. Believe me? Oh, Phil, I... I want to, but... But what? But you're talking about tomorrow. I'm worried about tonight. I'm afraid, Phil. Awfully afraid. I spent the next ten minutes trying to convince Donna that there wasn't anything to worry about. And then when she'd gone to her room, I went to mine and started all over again trying to convince myself. The out-of-season fireworks at the cabin and the gun stolen from my car made that a very tough proposition. And I checked the room, which was on the ground floor and close to the kitchen. And then I bolted the door and looked forward to some much-needed sleep. After that, I took off my shirt and shoes only, got into bed, and waited for sleep, which a weekend of skiing made more important than a cabin full of hate. Suddenly, I was wide awake and sitting straight up in bed. The footsteps could have belonged to my dream. The door that closed couldn't have. I scrambled out of bed and ran to it, but it was still bolted. So I turned to the single closet in the room and opened it sharply. It was empty, except for a long, thin finger of light that streamed through a keyhole. A keyhole that belonged to a door at the rear of the closet that gave out onto the kitchen. Obviously, the closet had once been a pantry. I tried the door, but it was bolted from the kitchen side. I got into my shoes, grabbed my shirt, and ran out of the room around to the kitchen and smacked into a very surprised Ralph Tolman. Marlo, what are you doing up and roaming around? I'm a sleepwalker. What's your excuse? Come on, let's have it. I'm through playing target for tonight. Target! Get your hands off me, Marlo. When I know why you're here and exactly what's on your mind, I will not before. Well, have we come to terms? All right, all right, let go. I'm here because my room is on the ground floor, and I heard somebody cross through the house and come into this kitchen. So I decided to investigate. You're a liar. You're in my room, Tolman, and you know it. You got in through the door that leads into the closet. Come on, Buster, let's level. We're keeping each other awake. Listen, Marlowe, I don't like you. Honest? And I don't like the way you and Donna are... The way we're what? Come on, boy, get it off your chest. Never mind that now. Look at this. Wood shaving, so what? Yeah, found it near the door to the closet in your room. Might also be the answer to who your visitor was. She left her calling card. What do you mean, calling card? Helen. She's always covered with these shavings. She makes things out of rough pine. Where is this workshop of hers, Tolman? Out in the back, just beyond the barn. What are you going to do, Marlowe? Not that it's any of your business, but I'm going to see the lady, and I'll see you. What do you want? Conversation, Helen, if you don't mind. Now, wait a minute, you it's late. Close and I that don't... door. I will not. Then I will. Get over there and sit down. We got a few things to clear up. Like what? The way you murdered my husband, perhaps? Cut it out. Stop it, Helen, or I'll push your arm off. Go Just as soon as you decide to behave. Those nails no. of yours draw blood, baby. Were they going to be good? Yes. All right. Now, 
Now sit down. Over there, away from those sharp chisels you work with and keep your hands in your lap. Go on, that chair there. Very well, Mr. Marlowe. Anything to accommodate the man who murdered my husband. Which brings us right to the point. You deny it. You deny that you shot him down. I fired in self-defense. That's a rotten, speaking lie. You did it to feather your own nest to be a hero to the police and the newspapers. You're wrong, Helen. I killed your husband because I had to. He was on the wrong side. Oh, don't make me laugh. You call trying to get money for his family, for me? You call that being on the wrong side? So much that he should have been killed, shot down by the likes of you? Oh, Mr. Marlowe, you have no idea how through these past six lonely months I've thought of you. I've wondered what you looked like, what the man who killed Virgil was doing. How you'd like to meet the same death you brought to my husband under the brave banner of law and order. Now, wait a minute, And don't think I didn't plan your death a thousand times over. Don't think I didn't approach Mama Barucki, Ralph, even sweet little Donna with a delicious thought of revenge. No. No, they talk like you talk, Mr. Marlowe. Virgil was doing the wrong thing. He was caught. It wasn't right or wrong. It was him or me. Oh, you shut up and listen. Sure. Sure, Virgil was stealing, all right. He was stealing from me, his wife. That's why he left here. That's why he tried so hard. That's why you had no reason to kill him. And that's why you should die, too. Oh, that's also why we had an accidental explosion at the cabin I was supposed to sleep in, huh? I was clumsy. I was hasty. I won't be the next time. You're completely out of your mind, Helen. Out of my mind? Of course I am. Did you think this existence, this living without the man I love, could leave me otherwise? Did you think making these stupid souvenirs could take his place? Killing me isn't going to bring him back. You get out of here. Go on, get out. And if you can, Mr. Marlowe, go back to bed. While you wait for a chance to get me with my own gun, the gun you stole from my car? I'm not going to shoot you, Mr. Marlowe. That would only further disgrace the Baraki name, no. No, I'm not going to shoot you. But I am going to get you. For a long, chilling moment, I stared into the eyes of the half-crazed woman standing in front of me. The ice-cold, bottomless eyes that a cancerous hate had destroyed as something human. Then as I turned and started out of the room, I knew that I'd made a mistake that night. And Virgil Barucki had died in my arms. A mistake I had to correct before it was too late. And there was nothing left of Helen but the ruthless machinery of a mind dedicated to murder. I headed back to the house and a talk with Mama Barucki, which I figured had to be the first immediate step. But when I'd gone only a dozen yards from the workshop, I stopped. Bill, Bill, I'm over here. Donna, what are you doing out here? I couldn't sleep, Bill. I, I was too worried about you. And then when I saw you leave the house from my window and head for the workshop, <laughs> I... Oh, Bill, Bill, your face. Oh, it was Helen. She, uh... She got a little upset in there. A little? Who would look at you? Your pocket ripped off your shirt, hmm? your face scratched. Oh, it's all right, Donna. I... No. Hey. Hey, my pocket ripped off. The gun. Oh, Bill, what is it? Tell me, please. I now, hold it, Donna. Give me a second. Yeah, yeah, sure, it adds all right. Now, look, get over there inside the barn and scream. Long and loud, huh? Scream? Yeah, yeah, it's our only chance. Go on, do as I say, Donna. Scream. All right. second Donna cut loose, I stepped out of sight behind a tree that was opposite the barn, and I kept my eyes glued to the door of the workshop I just left. I waited for the shattering report of the gun I was afraid I'd hear. But then the door flew her open, and Helen was running out toward the barn, and Donna screamed. <coughs> my thirty eight clenched in a handkerchief in her right hand, a look of stark bewilderment stamped over her face. Donna, answer me! What's wrong? Donna, what are you doing there by the barn? I don't know, Helen. What do you mean you don't know? It's a favor to me. Helen, let's have that gun back without further no, discussion. No, no. Yes! There! Now get back against that wall and don't move an inch. No! No, I... Bill, she... Bill, what is all this? Attempted murder, honey. She's all right. Attempted murder? You mean Helen here was going to try and kill someone? Yeah, herself. A suicide? Uh Uh-huh, suicide. That would be called murder and pinned on me. It's going to be her way of getting even. I know, Bill. I I can't believe it. She tried to once, honey. The explosion at the cabin. When that failed and everybody knew how she felt about me, a warped mind hit upon this little plan, and all the pieces would have fit tight, too. What pieces? What do you mean? That one we argued. Two, she came to my room tonight and ripped the pocket off this plaid shirt so that we'd find it clenched in her hand after she was dead. You see it? Three, she stole my thirty-eight, which has my fingerprints on it. And four, she left an obvious clue on the floor of the kitchen, a wood shaving that would bring me out here on the run so everybody could find me close by when it happened. Oh, yeah, it was tight, all right. 
Tight as a hangman's noose. And then she was going to shoot herself, Phil, just after you left her. And that, that's why you made me scream? Yeah. And that's why now, Donna, later tonight I'm going to tell her something that I intended to break to her gently. Oh. Something I was going to tell Mama Barucki first. You... Something I hoped would straighten her out. What, Phil? Well, your brother Virgil didn't die the moment he was shot, Donna. He, oh. he lived long enough to ask one thing of me. What are, what are you trying to say, Phil? But I never let Helen or you people here know about the woman he was in love with in L.A. He... The woman through whom I tracked him down. Oh, Phil. Yeah. Phil. Well, I... I guess it... It wouldn't be good for her if... If I was around too much? No, honey, not for a while, anyway. It wouldn't be good for any of us, huh? Come on, Donna, let's get her into the house. Yes. Yes, Phil. <laughs> well, it was the next morning. I went into the kitchen for some coffee and found myself all alone. Thought I wasn't any place in sight. So I got my things together and walked slowly down to my car and... When I got in, I didn't feel like leaving. Not right away. And I was glad that warming up my motor was the smart thing to do. Gave me time to light a cigarette and think. Look around. Back toward Echo Lodge where... <laughs> I could see Donna waving goodbye from an upstairs window. Yeah. Sure. I'd see her again in a little while. It was a small world, all right. Full of echoes. And just think how the web of paths we call coincidence had brought me and those who knew and loved Virgil together. Someday, maybe, Donna and I would be looking for each other. And those paths would make it a lot easier. <laughs> Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Sammy Hill, Betty Lou Gerson, Verna Felton, Frank Gerstel, and Junius Matthews. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a peddler of pulp paper love, a blackmailer with muscles, a south of the border chiseler, a simpering prude, and a corpse in a bedroom, all had one thing in common. Each was a woman. <laughs> Al Jolson will pay another of those wonderful visits to Bing Crosby this Wednesday night. And the gags and songs will again fly thick and fast. Bing and Al will team up to sing Waiting for the Robert E. Lee and Whispering. And as for the gags, well, just tune in on most of these same CBS stations. Remember, that's this Wednesday night, the CBS Bing Crosby Show. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, where you bet your life with Groucho Marx every Wednesday, the Columbia Broadcasting System.